It's time to stay awake Watching o'er the sea For we don't know what lies ahead Tempest or storm My duty is to warn For safety for the lives of men Watching through the darkest nights Watching for the crewmen's lives Standing ready and more sure With God's help I will endure Holding fast the steady course With our captain You can take your Bible and go to Isaiah chapter 1. We've been looking at Pentecost since it was three weeks back. And we've been working our way up through Acts chapter 1. Now you're in Isaiah 1, you can stay there. Just reiterate in Acts 1, 6. It says, when they therefore were come together... They asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? The kingdom to Israel. See, they knew the kingdom teaching. They knew about the coming kingdom. The Lord Jesus Christ had covenanted them a position in the kingdom to come, where they would sit and judge the twelve tribes of Israel. They knew that restoration would happen. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 21 says, How is the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment. Righteousness lodged in it. But now murderers. Sounds like the White House. What it represented at one time. And now it's all gone to pot. Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves gifts and follows after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. It's talking about Jerusalem, the city that represented God, the place where God chose to place his name, the place that should righteousness should be there, where judgment should be there. This is what it's become. Therefore saith the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will cease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of my enemies, and I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross, and take away all thy tin, and also sin. And I will restore thy judges, this is what the promise said, as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterwards thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful what? City. The faithful city. You see, Jesus Christ knew that there would be a time coming when God would deal with Jerusalem, remove the iniquity, and place in it good people, and it would once again be a city of righteousness. The question, will thou now restore again the kingdom? See, this went through the minds of the disciples. Jerusalem was perverted. The priesthood was perverted. The scribes and the Pharisees were working for themselves. They enlarged the borders of their own garments. They wanted to be seen and applauded of men. This was the condition of God's people. Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom? Is this the time when Jerusalem's going to be purged? Is this the time that it's going to be cleansed? Is this the time when the times of restitution are going to come? 
Is this the time that when you said, I appoint unto you a kingdom or I covenant unto you a kingdom as my father has appointed or has covenanted unto me that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He went through his passion. He was raised from the dead. He spent 40 days teaching them the things concerning the kingdom of God. What logical conclusion could they come to next but to ask the question, is this the time, Lord? Is this the time that all of that which we know about the Old Testament had prophesied and all that you have taught us those 40 days concerning the kingdom of God? Is this the time that it's going to come to pass? What other question could they possibly ask? Knowing what they knew. They were thinking about the coming kingdom. Is this really going to happen today? Is today the day? Okay. And yet as wonderful as the promise of the coming kingdom was. And David a righteous branch. And the king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and justice in, in the earth. And in his days, in his days Judah shall be saved and all Israel shall dwell safely. They knew that scripture in Jeremiah. They knew the scripture in Isaiah where it said, And of the increase of his government, there shall be peace and there shall be no end to that increase. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth forever and ever. Is this the time the kingdom is going to be restored? He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. He had a covenant meal containing salt on the day of the ascension when he gave these promises. He knew that the kingdom was given to David and his sons forever by a covenant of salt. They knew it too. Is all of this going to come together? Is all of this going to be the time and the day and the hour? Now, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom? And yet, there was something else that was in the mind of God. There was something else that God needed to do. I want you to understand, that's the end of the book. That's the final destiny. That's finish. The end is the kingdom being restored coming to earth, living forever and ever and ever with the Lord. That's the end of the book, but it wasn't the end. There was something else that God had to do and wanted to do and had planned to do, something that he had kept secret since the foundation of the world and nobody knew. See? And in order for them to accomplish God's will, to carry out this secret, this mystery, they needed to have power they needed to have power so the command was go on to Jerusalem and wait there until you be endued with power from on high also known as the promise of the father in Acts verse 5 of chapter 1 you can go to chapter 1 now if you like it says for John truly baptized with water this is what Jesus Christ is telling them but you shall be baptized with Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So this is the last thing he was telling them. They're going to receive power and then they're going to what? Witness for him over the uttermost part of the earth. First at Jerusalem, then at Judea, and then the whole world. 
That's what he said. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. See? He was taken up, and a cloud received them in their sight, out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, two men stood beside them in white apparel. They were looking at Jesus Christ. He was speaking in verse 9. And while he was speaking in verse 9, it says, When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, they were looking at him, right in front of them, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. He went up into a cloud and he disappeared. And while they were looking towards heaven, they were looking at that cloud. They were looking for their Lord and Savior. While they were steadfastly, while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white, what? Apparel. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, ye men of Galilee. That's why we know Judas wasn't here, because Judas wasn't of Galilee. He was, as, uh, he was from Eschar. Judas Iscariot from Eschar. Ye men of Galilee, that's what they said. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into what? Heaven. Now we got another promise that has entered the scene. They already have the promise of power from on high. Now God sends two angels. These are not men, these are angels. God sends two angels. And the angels say to him, they say to the apostles, this Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. While they beheld, he was taken up. A cloud received them out of their sight. The two men, the two angels were on a mission from God to further confirm this solemn, solemn event. Jesus spent 40 days teaching them concerning the things of the kingdom of God. He then commanded them to go to Jerusalem and don't depart until they receive the promise from on high. He had a covenant salt meal together with them before he left. They knew about the knowledge of the kingdom. They knew it was given to David and his sons forever by a covenant of salt. They knew that they were covenant, a position in the coming kingdom to sit and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. They knew Isaiah 1 and about the restoration of Jerusalem and how it would be safe. They knew Isaiah where they, his government is going to last forever and he's going to judge in righteousness. They knew Jeremiah where Judah would dwell in safety. They had all these promises round and round in their head. And all of those things that Jesus did to prepare them. And then God does something else. With all of that, if that's not enough, God does something else. And you know what he does? He sends two angels. And he sends two angels. Because God continues to certify and to emphasize the words of the Lord Jesus Christ by sending these two angels who gave them further encouragement. And the further encouragement that the angels gave was about his return. It was about his return. And it's interesting to note that the first words of encouragement the angels spoke was regarding the hope of of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will see him in like manner. They gave. This great truth was repeated 
in the book of Thessalonians to the Thessalonian believers when Paul received this revelation. Things were real tough for the Thessalonians. That's why God gave them the revelation of the hope of the return of Jesus Christ to keep them going, to help them move through the hard times that was coming and that they were enduring. They needed the revelation of the hope to keep them going. Likewise, God reminded the apostles and the disciples of the hope on the day that Jesus Christ ascended. So they could have that burning in their hearts that he is what? Coming back in like manner. In like manner. Sir Ernest Shackleton was an explorer and an adventurer. And on August 8th, 1914, one week after Germany declared war on Russia, 29 men set sail in a three-masted wooden ship from Plymouth, England to Antarctica on a quest to become the first to cross the Antarctica continent on foot. Shackleton had recruited his crew through advertisement. His bill read like this, Men wanted for a hazardous journey. Small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Shackleton was an honest man, and his crew experienced everything that his handbill promised in spades. Shackleton was also an able leader, and he was a certified hero. His men came to refer to him as the boss, although he never thought of himself in that way. He worked just as hard as any one of his crew members, and he built a solid team of unity upon the ship that he aptly named Endurance. And in January 1915, the ship became trapped in an ice pack, and it eventually sank, leaving his men to set up camp on a flat, free floating piece of sea ice called an ice flow. Shackleton kept his men busy day and night, kept them working during the day, he kept them entertained at night. They played ice soccer, they had nightly song fest, they held regular sled dog competitions. It was on this ice flow that Shackleton proved his greatness as a leader. He willingly sacrificed his right to a warmer fur-lined sleeping bag so that one of his men could have it. He personally served hot milk to his men every morning in their tents. In April of 1916, their thinning ice flow began to break apart forcing the men to seek refuge on a nearby Elephant Island. Knowing that rescue from such a desolate place was unlikely, Shackleton and five others left and crossed 800 miles of open Antarctic sea in a 20-foot lifeboat with a little more than a hope than a promise of return to those people with a rescue party. Finally, on August 30th, after a 105-day trip and three earlier attempts, Shackleton returned to rescue his stranded crew, becoming their hero. But perhaps the real hero of the story was a man named Frank Wilde, 
Frank Wilde was Shackleton's second in command. He was left in charge of Shackleton's camp during his absence. He maintained the routine that his boss had established. He assigned duties. He served meals. He held sing-alongs. He planned athletic competitions. And in general, he kept the morale of the people up. The camp was in constant danger of being buried from snow and becoming completely invisible from the sea where the rescue party would be looking for it. Wild kept the men busy by shoveling away the snow drifts. The firing of a gun was the prearranged signal that the rescue ship was going to be nearing the island so they could listen for it. But as Wilde reported, many times when the glaciers were claving and chunks fell off, would a report like a gunshot. We thought it was the real thing, but time after time we began to distrust these things. But we never lost hope in the boss. Confidently, Wilde kept the last tin of kerosene and a supply of dry combustibles ready to ignite instant to use as a locator symbol when the day of wonders would arrive. With barely four days of rations left in the camp, Shackleton finally came on a Chilean icebreaker. He personally made several trips in the icy waters in a small lifeboat to ferry his crew back to safety. Miraculously, the fog had lifted long enough for all the men to make it onto the icebreaker within one hour. Shackleton later learned from the men that they were prepared to break camp quickly. They were being trained. From a fortnight after, I left wild. He would roll up his sleeping bag each day. And he would say to the men, get ready, boys. Today may be the day the boss is coming for you. And he kept that hope alive in those people's hearts. And sure enough, one day, the mist opened and revealed the ship for which they had been waiting, longing, and hoping for, for over four months. Wild's cheerful anticipation proved infectious. And we were all well prepared when the evacuation day came. Shackleton stranded and threatened crew desperately hoped for their captain that he would come back for them. But as diligent as and as dedicated as Shackleton was, his crew could not be certain that he would return. He was, after all, a mere man battling the elements that he had no control over. They knew that he might not make it back. Get Titus chapter 1, please. Titus 1. Man needs hope to carry on. Man needs that hope to look towards. And on the day of the ascension, after all that Jesus did, after all that was accomplished, there was one more thing that needed to be done, and God sent two angels to do it. And that was to give them hope, the hope of the return of their Savior, of their Lord. For in like manner, he shall what? Return. Because God knew what was going to happen and the pressure they were going through. And he needed to get them to the day of Pentecost so they could be what? Endued with that power to carry out the mission. Titus 1 verse 2, it says, In hope, Titus 1 verse 2, pardon me, In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world what? God doesn't what? And he made a promise. He promised, wait for the promise of the Father. And he made another promise 
on the day of the ascension. That promise was, ye men of Galilee, why gaze ye up into heaven? This Jesus shall return in like manner. He promised that Jesus would what? Come back. He gave them hope. Hebrews chapter 10. The English Standard Version reads of verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is what? You hold on to it. You don't let anybody talk you out of it. See? And then that's what those angels told those believers who went on to do great things for God. This Jesus in like manner is going to what? Return. Go back to Acts now, chapter 1. Acts 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, Jesus, while they beheld him, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. And while they, the believers, the disciples, the apostles, were looking steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. You'd be looking up in heaven too if you seen somebody <laughs> beaming up in slow motion. And the next thing you know, you got two guys down here in white apparel. They said unto him, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into what? They gave him the hope. They needed the hope. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2, verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto what? Glory. Glory. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through what? Suffering. Sufferings. Sufferings. Jesus Christ is coming back. This is our hope. He's there to guide us through the storms of life. We can hang in there. We can push through this. Because he promised he's coming back. And unlike Shackleton, our Lord and our Savior, the captain of our salvation, has all authority over heaven and all authority over earth, including controlling the elements. Hebrews 13.8 says Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and what? Forever. Forever. This was the word of the Lord to the apostles on the day of the ascension. This was to give them hope. This is the word of the Lord to the church today. To give us hope. The hope of his return. Our Lord and our brother, the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your promise. And that you cannot lie. Thank you that we can hold fast to our confession of this hope, Father. And thank you for the captain of our salvation, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And may we continue to walk in this holiness and in this blessedness. In his thank you. Don't forget to click that like button and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And remember, if we are shut down for uh, some type of censorship reason, you can always check out our videos at www.cvm.church. Thank you for your patronage. This was brought to you by Chapter and Verse Ministry. It's time to stay awake, watching o'er the sea, for we don't know lies ahead tempest or storm my duty is to warn for safety for the lives of men watching through the darkest nights watching for the crewmen
one's lives standing ready and more sure with god's help i will endure holding fast the steady course with our captain for